Unfortunately, that's what we've seen with the origin of COVID. It's, it's gotten to this very bizarre situation where if it comes from a market, somehow the Democrats win. Or if it comes from a lab, the Republicans win. But the truth of the matter is, like, if we don't find the origins, like, we all lose together. Hello, John Perry here. It is January 1st, 2022. Welcome back. My guest today is Dr. Alina Chan. She has agreed to come back on to respond to some of the questions and concerns that my viewers had last time she was on. Dr. Chan has been very vocal about the possibility that COVID-19 might have jumped from animals to humans through an accident at a medical research lab. I do recommend you listen to our first video if you haven't seen that yet. But just a little bit of background before she comes on. At the start of the pandemic, various lab leak hypotheses were talked about in the media as if they were fringe conspiracy theories believed only by extreme right-wing Christians and Republicans. Because of this, a lot of my viewers have thought it's odd that I have been interested in various lab leak hypotheses because, I mean, I'm an atheist and I tend to lean pretty far to the left politically. But the truth is, there are many scientists and journalists and educators from all different sorts of political and religious backgrounds who have been worried from the start that COVID-19 may have accidentally leaked from a medical research lab. As of now, January 1st, 2022, most scientists and public health officials still suspect that COVID-19 most likely had a natural origin. And personally, I do lean that way as well. But... Even among us on Team Natural, most of us do recognize that an in-depth investigation into the possibility of a lab leak does need to happen. I do not have any accounting of what the Chinese may have done, and I'm fully in favor of any further investigation of what went on in China. Maybe they could have been studying it and accidentally it infected a few people and got released. That's total speculation, but I don't think we could rule that out. Many letters signed by scientists have now been published by traditional media outlets, as well as in various scientific journals, calling for a thorough international investigation into the possibility of a lab leak. WHO tried to do that. The results were not satisfying to anybody. We need to try again here with real access to all the information and find out what really went on. This letter here was co-written by Dr. Alina Chan, but she was not alone. Along with her name, we find that of Ralph Barrick, a virologist who used to work directly with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. He is one of several scientists who has helped them genetically modify coronaviruses for medical purposes. And he believes their lab, the lab of his own colleagues, does need to be investigated. Also on this letter, we find the name of Dr. David A. Relman. Relman is a microbiologist from the Stanford School of Medicine. But more importantly, for many years now, he has played an active role consulting the U.S. federal government on biosafety issues in the field of virus research. He has a very deep and very broad understanding of the types of research happening all around the world. He is very familiar with the risk-benefit calculations done to justify dangerous research, and he helped shape some of the safety protocols used by scientists that work with risky pathogens. What I'm trying to say here is that even though Alina Chan is probably the most vocal scientist right now about the possibility of a lab leak, she is not just another one of these lone wolf scientists or medical professionals that we keep seeing pop up throughout this pandemic to sell us a new tin hat conspiracy theory. Alina's concerns are well-founded and have been endorsed by many other researchers who have a deep understanding of the situation surrounding the origin of COVID-19. Each question and topic discussed today came directly from our viewers, either via YouTube comments under our last conversation or via emails sent directly to me. Sadly, we did not have enough time to cover every single question, but the, the things we covered were really interesting, and I had a lot of fun with this conversation. We start by addressing a question asked by YouTube commenter Stefan. Why does it, the origin of COVID-19, matter right now? And as you'll see, Stefan's concern seems to be shared by Francis Collins, the former director of the National Institutes of Health. Longtime followers of mine will know that even though Alina and I disagree with his statement on this particular topic, I do have great respect for that man, and I was, I was really sad to see him retire. 
Alina and I saved all the juicy clickbait for the end of our conversation. There we talk about the reported rise in racism against people of Asian descent, and we discuss the co-author of Alina's book, Matt Ridley. He's a guy who some of my viewers really don't seem to like. So, without further ado, here is my conversation with Dr. Alina Chan. Thank you for sharing your time. I, I don't know how you're doing all this and your job. It's crazy. I just work extra hard and then pass out. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've tried to say no to as many interviews as possible, but I, I value this one because the audience cool. is different. Like, yeah. So it, I, yeah. I like it a lot that you are, you are scientist, like you're scientifically trained and your audience is very science interested. Um, and that's why we're getting all these really interesting comments, right? I feel like it's more of a deep dive than I usually get with the more uh, basic, like first time interviews. Cool. Yeah. Great. You said you wanted to start by talking about Francis Collins, his retirement. For those who don't know, Francis Collins is was the director of the National Institutes of Health in the USA. Francis Collins just retired, and you wanted to talk about something that he said when he went on Fox News, right? He said that the lab leak was a distraction. He was trying to talk about Omicron, yeah. and he kept getting interrupted to talk about the lab leak. Let's just take a look at the clip. Well, Brett, I'm really sorry that the lab leak has become such a distraction for so many people, because frankly, we still don't know. There is no evidence really to say. Most of the scientific community, myself included, think that is a possibility, but far more likely this was a natural way in which a virus left a bat, maybe traveled through some other species and got the humans, and there was no lab leak involved. We won't know unless China decides to open up about this, which they have not done, and yeah. shame on them for that. Yeah, I, I think that there are enough scientists in this world that both important questions can be addressed at the same time. And that's actually what we saw China doing in the early days of the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, the reason for having to urgently identify the source of the origin uh, of, the, of the pandemic is so that you can shut down these sources of the virus, right? Because pandemics and outbreaks grow in an exponential manner. So you can be doing your best efforts to put out the fire as it grows exponentially, but if you don't turn off the, the faucet where, where the water is pouring out, where this virus is spilling over or, or leaking from a lab, let's say, just more and more of it will come out. And that's why both need to be addressed at the same time. Uh, we've seen Taiwan recently do that very efficiently. So when uh, SARS-CoV-2 escaped from a biosecurity level 3 lab in Taiwan, not only did they immediately contact trace all of the hundreds of people who had been exposed to this individual mm -hmm. from the lab, but they also went straight to the lab, started sequencing the strains, trying to match it to the patient strain. So they they could do both things at once. It's, it's not a situation where we have to do all the contact tracing, do all these other things first, and then years later, <laughs> come back and see how did this get started. So for those who don't know, and I think most Americans didn't ever hear about this, but there was a lab in Taiwan that was studying SARS-CoV-2. So this is recently, this is like a couple of days ago or a couple of weeks ago. One of the researchers was bit by a mouse. She started to feel a little bit sick, but she didn't imagine she had COVID because no one in Taiwan right now has COVID, right? They've, they've completely stomped it out. Yes, Taiwan is actually a zero COVID country. So they, they have extremely few cases. Before this uh, scientist was found to have ca caught COVID, uh, there had been a span of some 35 days with zero new COVID cases in Taiwan. Right. And so she got COVID from her mouse, from a mouse that she was working with. So th that part is still kind of unclear. So, uh, but the Taiwanese authorities are taking this very seriously and they, they immediately went to the lab once they knew about this diagnosis and they started testing everything, the surfaces, the mice. Uh, and they discovered that this, this worker who was in her 20s had been bitten not once, but actually twice by mice in the lab while working with them. They found that the mice had been handled outside of the biosecurity a biosafety cabinet, so in a, in a place where you are more exposed to it, even though you're still fully decked in protective uh, equipment. Yeah. Uh, they found that there was a virus contaminating door handles and tables in the BSL-3 facility. Uh, they found that uh, it's possible that because the worker took her mask off first before the rest of her outfit, she might have contaminated herself that yeah. way. So there are actually multiple ways that she might have caught it in the lab rather than the mouse bite. Yeah, I, I did think that was a little bit weird because... I mean, through the blood directly is an unusual route. I know that we have ACE2 receptors in our blood vessels, so you could get COVID through there, but she seemed to be 
expressing normal COVID symptoms, right? Which would seem like she must have gotten an infection in her respiratory tract. It's it's difficult to know because uh the way that some some scientists have done experiments uh, inoculating animals with uh, with SARS like viruses is that in some in some cases they even do an inoculation into the brain, so they inject it into the brain of the animal, and yet the highest titers are still found in the lungs afterwards. Yeah, so it it's unclear how many different ways it could get into your body, but it still manifests in the same symptoms. And the surprising thing was that this worker had been fully vaccinated with Moderna. So she, she, I can understand why she wouldn't think that she had COVID, even when she developed a fever and she was going about town for more than a week uh, without testing because she had been fully vaccinated. Uh, she had been told by a supervisor that it was fine, <laughs> that, that, there's, I, that it was unlikely for her to get infected with COVID in the lab because of her status, and she was young as well. So, But she, eventually, when she lost her sense of smell and taste, that's when she was like, yeah, I should probably go get tested, oh, right? No. So then she went and got tested, and by then she had been in the community there to uh, test like hun- more than 100 people and put them put a lot of them into quarantine. Okay. So yeah. did do we know if she spread it to anyone else? So far, it doesn't seem like it. So it's quite lucky that she didn't. Oh, man. That that really is a scary story. And the, I mean, it, it does highlight, of course, the possibility of a lab leak, right? I mean, it's, it's just an, one one other little bit of circumstantial evidence. Again, very circumstantial evidence. This is a totally different incident but the thing with taiwan is that it's a zero covid country so it's it's fairly straightforward when a scientist gets infected with yeah. sars cov 2 that you're like yeah maybe it's from the lab but in places like the us even though there are probably dozens of labs working with sars cov 2 samples or virus there's no way to really know whether the scientist got infected in the lab or in the streets like true exposure to people you're saying that they were able to do contact tracing they were able to stomp it out it looks like they've stomped it out. Yeah. So the yeah. it looks like it probably never even went to anyone. Yeah. And if yeah. even if it did, they've quarantined everyone that she was in contact with and the people that they were in contact with. Yeah. They're taking this very seriously. Well, even that, if she had gotten on a plane, it would be impossible to 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 track that. You know, it's a really good example of how how easy it is to spread a virus. That that actually happened with the first SARS virus. So it had been studied at a BSL-4, the highest biosecurity level lab uh, in Taiwan as well. And this researcher had been infected and then went on an international trip to Singapore to attend a conference. Thankfully, he only developed symptoms the day after he landed back in Taiwan. So imagine if he had gotten sick or had a longer trip in Singapore, it would have been an international incident. Yeah. And for those who don't remember, SARS-CoV-1 really only spreads when you are showing symptoms. It doesn't have the asymptomatic spread like like SARS-CoV-2. So, yeah. Is there anything else that you want to say about that, like the importance of focusing on both of these things right now? Yeah. So I think we can do both at the same time. And in fact, we need to do both at the same time. Um, I also want to press the point that this pandemic, we will never finish we will never finish with COVID-19. Like there will always be COVID-19 around the world ongoing somewhere, especially in underprivileged places and developing countries. So pandemics also have a uh, disproportionate effect on places where it's difficult to get healthcare, difficult to get access to vaccines, to diagnosis. So we we will never run out of new variants. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like today it's the Omicron, like Next week, who knows what it will be? Like we're <laughs> gonna start naming variants after like constellations. So it, uh, there will never be a day when people are like, okay, we're done, and now we can go look at the origins. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah, it, it's very problematic, and that's why I think we really have to prevent future pandemics, future loss of life, future burdens on developing countries by stopping these pandemics as they happen, like at, at on day one. So yeah. knowing how they happen and stopping those processes from from leading to future pandemics. I know that a lot of people are mad at Francis Collins and uh, Anthony Fauci. Be- for, well, for one reason, they they were classically in favor of gain of function research. I think, like as we dig into the origin stuff, I'm sure there's going to be a big trial in the U.S. and there's going it's probably going to be on TV and it's going to be a big huge deal. All the things that they said in the past about gain of function research and virology is going to get brought up. And people are going to want to hate them. 
But Francis Collins has done an excellent job. He's been on the wrong side of some arguments, but he's done an excellent job. His comment the other day when he was saying that as he was leaving that this is a distraction. His job is not to accuse China of crimes against humanity. <laughs> like that's ever since the start of this pandemic, the the healthcare officials in the United States have been very careful in their comments to the public not to say anything that would offend people in China. And some people are saying, well, they're just being weak. They should just confront this. But what they have to do behind the scenes is they have to work with people in China to try and get as much information as they can. So it never made sense for them to attack. You know, we have we do have politicians that you could say it is their job to do this. Tom Cotton bringing to the public's attention that this pandemic might be a result of a lab accident. And he was doing that from the very start. And he was being very harsh with China. And I think that division of labor makes sense because... <laughs> We, you don't need every healthcare official to be burning bridges with their colleagues in China. Just for, for proof of this, there was, what is the guy's name? He was the CDC director underneath Trump. Robert Redfield? Robert Redfield, when he left, he said, now that I'm a civilian, it's okay for me to have an opinion about this. Here is Dr. Robert Redfield when he sat down with Sanjay Gupta. I am of the point of view that I still think the most likely uh, etiology of this pathogen in Wuhan was a, from a laboratory, um, you know, escaped. That's my own view. It's an only opinion. I'm allowed to have opinions now. The other people don't believe that. That's fine. Science will eventually figure it out. It's not unusual for respiratory pathogens that are being worked on in a laboratory to infect the laboratory worker. What I thought was interesting in, in that statement is he said, now that I'm a civilian, I can have an opinion about this. So... What he was telling us is that when he was a healthcare official, he was bending over backwards not to be offensive because that would have screwed up his job. He wouldn't have been able to do his job if he had offended people. So a lot of people are attacking Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci over them not being tough on China. But it's I would argue that it's not their job to be tough on China. I think I, I also want to emphasize a point that we discussed in our first interview is, is that sometimes you have to look at individuals in totality, looking at all of the things they do, not, not just on one issue. So they could be doing a, a pretty bad job on one issue, but you, you need to consider that they are doing like 99 other things. And that if you look at the 100 things they're doing, they're actually doing a lot of good. And, and you need to calibrate your judgment of, of these individuals. Like I always try to give them maximum like benefit of the doubts. Like, is it that they just haven't spent enough time looking into this issue? So they themselves are not all aware of what's happening and they're just trusting the words of people who might have conflicts of interest. So like if they were very good friends of Peter Dashak, maybe they just kept getting the wrong information over the past two years. I mean, Peter Dashak has on so many accounts <laughs> Uh, contradicted facts <laughs> that, that Lisa were found to be true. So like, I, I think it depends like how much info uh, Francis Collins, for example, and then Dr. Anthony Fauci actually getting and, and who, who are your sources? So I, I have no interest in saying someone's evil or not. I just want to say, what is the information that you have? For example, if you have a lot of discussions that were redacted, maybe it helps the public trust if you unredact those email conversations so we can see what you were actually saying about the origin of COVID-19 in early 2020. One of the things that I think we're seeing here too is a difference in how, well, we're kind of seeing an old school version of public health communication that no longer works in the internet era. <laughs> It used to be that you would figure out what you think is best and then act as if you have absolute confidence in that and go talk to the, the public in that way. And that would be reassuring to people. People want a strong leader, you know. Nowadays, that doesn't work because we have so much communication and access to information that you can tell when someone's pretending to be confident about something. And that's... I think that's a big thing that changed, and I don't think that we've really adjusted in, in how we speak publicly yet. And I don't even know how we adjust because everything's complicated and new. This is one of the things that I, I see so many people getting really angry at them and saying, oh, they failed this and that. But we're dealing with all of this for the first time, and they're dealing with the power of the internet really in <laughs> full force for the first time and how that changes how communication should be done. I mean, pr pretty much everything they learned about PR 
is wrong now. As, especially for situations where the science is still emerging, where the science is yeah. still being performed, still being conducted. So how can you be confident when you don't know? So I, I almost feel that, at least for me as a scientist, if I don't know, even if it's a very basic fact, I'll just say, right now, I can't remember. I'll tell you later when I Google it. <laughs> right, <laughs> Rather right. than forcing something that trying to force myself to have a best guess and getting it wrong. I think the future will be a lot more transparent because of this. I think everyone's taken note of this. One of the things that that's, would have been nice, too, is if we had more people that were the representatives or if we cycled through people. I think... It's so hard to be right all the time. And, it's, and what happens is you can be right 99% of the time and be doing good 99% of the time. But those that 1% where you keep screwing up every once in a while, that builds up. People remember that. They don't remember all the times you were right. And so yeah. it's so easy to build massive enemies. The other thing right now in the United States, we have the, the politicians. The, the president is liberal. A lot of the political power is liberal right now. And the public health officials were liberal. Back when, it, when we had Trump, there was that mix between the two. And so you, you could have communication to both sides of the aisle that worked pretty well. I mean, Francis Collins actually was the only person that I, I, I see in like public health right now that's actually good at talking to the right. And now he's gone. <laughs> right now, there's kind of a vacuum. There's not good information that people on the far right or just, you know, even the middle right really trust because they're, they're skeptical of people on the left. And that's a problem that I, I'm kind of amazed that we didn't try to address that early on. I'm, I'm kind of amazed we didn't get some, we didn't try and keep someone like Robert Redfield, who is, who, you know, he was a conservative Christian guy. But have you seen all the angry tweets about him from virologists? They don't seem to like him very much. Okay. As, yeah. Especially after he uh, made that comment about the lab leak. That's okay. I mean, you, what I'm saying is that people on the right who don't trust the scientific community and don't trust the liberal politicians, they would have had Robert Redfield to be on their side, right? They, you know, he looks, you know, he's got kind of like an Amish style beard and he's got, he's, I'm pretty sure he's a Christian. People need to feel like they're being represented. And I think right now, one of the reasons that public health has been so poor and reaching the right is that people on the right don't feel like anyone in the government right now represents them. So we can complain and say that like, well, they, they just need to grow up, but that's that's not how the world works. <laughs> you have to meet people where they're at. So, And I think the media bears a lot of responsibility for this too. And we even saw this playing out with, with the vaccines, right? So which president would take credit for the vaccines? Yeah. And I think that is such a bad way to... to promote vaccines to say that this is a Trump product or this is a Biden product. Like, why not? Let's just say these are vaccines and no, no, none of the presidents are responsible for the vaccines. They happen because people working on vaccines made the vaccines. <laughs> so then it, it shouldn't be a situation where uh, I'm only going to get vaccinated if this was a Trump vaccine or I'm only going to get vaccinated if this was a Biden vaccine. That That is insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But again, that's where, that's where we're at. It's like, we can't. <laughs> yeah. It, We've got to get there. We got to get there from here. So I don't know if, did you see that Trump came on and said that he, he got his booster shot and he was booed off the, he wasn't booed off the stage, but he was booed by his audience. Did you see that? No, I did not see that, but I can imagine it. There's been a call from public health officials. They've been asking him to, to talk about the importance of vaccines and he finally did it. And he mm -hmm. did it to the, uh, like, to the hatred of his own audience. It was, it was interesting. Both the president and I are vaxxed, and uh, did you get the booster? Yes. I got it too. Okay, so... Um... Oh, don't, 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 no, no. We got a vaccine done in less than nine months that was supposed to take from five to 12 years. Because of that vaccine, because of that vaccine, millions and millions of people, I think this would have been the Spanish flu of 1917, where up to 100 million people died. This was going to ravage the country far beyond what it is right now. Take credit for it. Take credit for it. It's a great, what we've done is historic. Don't let them take it away. Don't take it away from ourselves. You're playing that, you're playing right into their hands. Whatever happens politically, it it's very secondary to me. The main goal is to get more people to be vaccinated. Yeah. Right? So, like, the point is not to have a whole faction of the country saying that I'm not going to be vaccinated because this is a democratic product. <laughs> right, right, right.
Um, and, and unfortunately, that's what we've seen with the origin of COVID. It's it's gotten to this very bizarre situation where if it comes from a market, somehow the Democrats win, or if it comes from a lab, the Republicans win. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is like, if we don't find the origins, like we all lose together. Not not even as just Americans alone, but everyone around the world loses together. Yeah, yeah, because we can't turn off this faucet, as you were saying. I do want to talk about Omicron really quickly and vaccines, because I think you would probably yeah. know, know, understand this a lot better than, than I would. A lot of people are upset with the, because the vaccines aren't, aren't working so well against Omicron. And so they're, they're saying, well, then what was the point of any of this? What is your response to that? I, I think that, that there's responsibility on both sides. And unfortunately, some people had marketed the vaccines as a way to uh, have sterilizing immunity. So by that word, I mean, once you get vaccinated, you'll never get COVID-19 again in your life, that kind of sterilizing immunity. But in reality, because this virus went on to infect like 300 million people, inevitably more and more variants evolved. And some of these evolved in immunocompromised people, for example, or or just through passing through areas where there was already a lot of pre-existing infection. So some of these variants can get around human immune responses to the original version of SARS-CoV-2. So what we're seeing is that some of these new variants can reinfect people who have been infected before, or it can even infect people who have been fully vaccinated with the vaccine that's designed based on the original SARS-CoV-2 virus. So now there's a lot of talk in the scientific community about how we should update our vaccines. Because one advantage of the uh, mRNA vaccine is that you can quickly update them, quickly uh like it is like updating your your Mac system, right? <laughs> so every every few months you can update a new version. So why not design vaccines where people are being inoculated with the spikes from Omicron, Delta, Alpha, maybe all at once in a cocktail? That way you have a very diverse uh, immune response. When I talk to people about vaccines, a lot of people did have the impression, and I'm not sure where they got it, but they they did think that it was going to be one vaccine and then they're, then yeah. we're done. Or well, the two doses of the vaccine and then we're done. But the research on coronaviruses back from the 80s, the the other coronavirus, we have four, I think, four coronaviruses that that circulate in humanity that we've had for ever. <laughs> we knew from research back in the 80s that we only maintain immunity to those for about for between two and 10 years and maybe even less. So we already knew that this was going to be a, a problem indefinitely, but I guess that was not communicated to the public. I've been looking at the the data, the research on this since the start, and the picture that I have of this has been just dramatically different from everybody that I talked to. So somehow we did a bad job communicating the science of all this. Yeah, I think part of the problem was that people were trying to make people get vaccinated. So in some sense, they might have gone overboard with selling the benefits of being vaccinated. So instead of being a bit more cautious with how you would try to set expectations for this vaccine, they were like, this is the best vaccine ever. It's the safest vaccine ever. (laughs) You will never get COVID again. And I think when you go too far and when uh, reality falls short of expectations, that's when a lot of people turn around and say, you lied to us, right? So I always think that people have to be more moderate when, when they sell a product. Under promise over deliver, right? That's that's a great phrase. <laughs> yeah, it's been very it's been very unfortunate to see this the anti vaccine stuff just explode. I've actually hesitated to talk about lab leak origins, even though it's been a concern of mine. One thing that I've noticed is that as soon as I turn people onto this idea, then they go online and start looking at it. And if you go online and start looking at the lab leak origin, you immediately get thrown into this world of conspiracy theories, anti-vax, really deep and quite crazy conspiracy theories. And I've seen some very intelligent people just fall down the rabbit hole. A colleague of mine has gone deep down this and is just, every once in a while I go check on, check on his stuff and he, it looks like he's gone crazy. It's absolutely bizarre. His audience went from, you know, people who were very scientifically literate and interested and curious to now his now his whole audience is just like raging conspiracy theorists and he's being fed by that and he's just getting deeper and deeper and deeper into this. And it's crazy to see that happen. And so I worry, am I throwing people into that garbage heap? Am I directing them to that chaos? I think it's important to point uh, 
people are hearing about the lab origin hypothesis mm-hmm. to to properly vetted sources to to at least peer reviewed letters or, or things like that or um my book. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that, but you beat me to the punch. Well, of course, I'm not speaking of self-bias, because, but I was extremely careful with this book. So it's like 15% of the book is citations. I, I wrote this with a very scientific approach. And like any fact in there can be fact-checked by you, by the reader themselves. Um, we don't use dubious sources. We, we use things that I would trust. Like I can verify it with my own eyes, and I did. I think one thing that surprises a lot of people is that I'm actually very skeptical whenever I uh, first hear of lab origin related evidence. And this has led to a lot of disagreements and fights between me and, and uh, internet sleuths and even scientists and journalists who are very pro lab leak. So I actually mm-hmm. get into like very nasty disagreements with them. I'd say those uh, disagreements are fiercer than the disagreements I get into with the natural origin crowd, if you can imagine that. Because uh, the folks who, who, from the lab leak side who, side who see me downplaying or dismissing what they think is very strong evidence for a lab leak. They they can accuse me of being uncovered, like covering for uh, Fauci, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Like they, they immediately jump to the idea that I have some sort of agenda to protect scientists when actually I'm just exercising the same skepticism towards lab-related evidence as I am towards natural origin-related evidence. So I think if you, if you find yourself consistently getting into disagreements with people who are like, quote, on your side, then I think you will at least be a bit safer knowing that you're not pandering to them and that you're not getting siloed. Yeah. Have you decided when you'll just step away, even if it's never figured out, do you have plans to step away from even talking about it? Or are you going to keep on doing this until we find an answer? Well, I think that there are ways to take steps back without uh, stopping entirely. And actually, the book was my way of closing the book on this issue. So I wanted to get everything I know down into one book and, and give it to people as a resource. So like here, if you need to know what I know, then this book is your resource. Uh, I might still play a role peripherally in, in some of these commissions and investigations that start next year uh, into the original of COVID-19. But I actually have a plan to slowly just leave social media. And I, I've already started it just this, this week. It's, it's just... Uh, once you stop engaging with people, you don't feel that pull to get back into Twitter and into disagreements or exchanges with people on Twitter. So I think I think I've done what I set out to do. I'm very satisfied <laughs> with where I am right now, and I don't. Um, I love my job and I love what I do at work. So I, I want to go back to that like 100 percent, like 200 percent. So the the Twitter thing is not sustainable. And it never was meant to be sustainable. I just wanted to stay on here long enough until the book was out, until uh, investigation is in sight. And I think those two things are happening. Big question for anyone who's supporting what some say is a conspiracy theory. What would convince you that a natural origin is the actual true cause of this? I'd like to lay out... um, what will convince me, which is a robust investigation into the origin of COVID-19. So what I mean by a robust investigation is, is like there, there are three things that need to be investigated. The first thing is tracking all of the early cases. So China has told us that they failed to identify any case before December 2019, which I find very surprising because they have the best expertise in the entire world for tracking novel coronavirus outbreaks in that city, in Wuhan. And yet they're telling us that in this city where almost everything is monitored, you, you, everyone has an ID, you've got your top SARS experts there, you could not even trace back from, from hundreds of cases in December to any cases in November. That's very shocking to me. Um, because without this data, without knowing who the first cases were, how do you know what their exposures were? How do you find the source of this virus? So that, that investigation is very important to me. It has to happen in order for like specific this positive evidence to be found surrounding the origin of COVID-19. So the second prong is an investigation into natural origins. So there has been some investigation according to the Chinese authorities and also by scientists outside of China who are sampling bats and wildlife trait animals. And collectively, they have not found any traces of SARS-2-like viruses in any of the wildlife trait, save for three pangolin coronaviruses that are still quite distantly related. So they're definitely not uh, the precursors or siblings of SARS-CoV-2. Um, the issue is that China has told us that they shut down the um, 
farms from South China that were supplying Wuhan city without testing. So this is kind of shocking is that one of the first things you should do is test the suppliers to see whether the virus was there. Like, yes, shut them down, but don't you want to definitively know that this was the source so that you can eliminate this national security concern? So we need access to those samples. We need access to the farmers, the traders. We need to talk to them. We need to, to figure out is there, is there actually any direct evidence pointing to a natural origin of SARS-CoV-2? And the last, the last prong is an investigation of a lab origin. So what this means is getting the lab notebooks, records, uh, having protected interviews of any key witnesses, personnel, collaborators in and outside of China. Because even if this virus, the genome is 100% natural, it doesn't rule out some very plausible lab origins, which is, for example, a researcher goes out and samples a sick animal or human and brings the virus back into the town. So without seeing their medical records, without knowing who the earliest cases were, without knowing what viruses were in their collection or what experiments were being done, it's very difficult for us to rule out a lab origin. You know, I, I told people to comment because, you know, mm -hmm. last the last time you were on, obviously this was this was a controversial topic. So I said, send any questions and comments you have and we will address those. A couple of people did that directly. They either emailed me or they commented clearly. One person was saying, why would China want to let foreign powers investigate their laboratory. The U.S. obviously would never let any any foreign country do that to our laboratories, so why should we expect the same from them? And I do have sympathy for that argument. A lot of the weird behavior that we've seen from the Chinese government and from the lab and so on could easily be explained by not wanting to get sabotaged by investigators. China has a lot of enemies. Well, I don't think China has many enemies that want to see it completely fall, but it's, there's a lot of people that want to see China stumble. And this is a great opportunity to throw something in the, in the mix and, and help them stumble. So a lot of their, even taking down their database, which seems really weird, that does make sense if you're worried that someone's trying to insert something into your database that wasn't actually there. How do we investigate that lab in a way that's not going to reveal projects they might be working on that they want to keep secret for patent reasons, for financial reasons, things that might be misinterpreted. I have these uh, skulls behind me here and they're plastic. They're, they're bone clones replicas. And I take them with me when I travel and do, do speaking events. And one time I had my bag searched at the airport. Must and, have uh, caused a lot of misunderstandings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Y you can be totally innocent and cause some major drama. In this case, it, was, it, was e it wasn't a big deal. I just told the lady, I was like, there's a skull in there that's plastic. I promise you it's plastic. It looks very real. And, and she, she freaked out. She's like, <laughs> you show, show me how I know that's not real. And it's like, hmm. it's like, here, let me, can I pick it up? She's like, yes, I'm not touching that. So I picked it up <laughs> and I showed her, you know, you, you can look inside of it and see that it's plastic. Uh, which is good advertising for bone clones, by the way. They, <laughs> it makes that replica. But it would be very easy for people to misinterpret things that they find in that lab and blow things out of proportion. I mean, there are reasons aside from being guilty that China is going to be acting weird about their lab, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that China is a beacon of transparency for the rest of the world to, to follow. Um, but let, let's look at the first SARS outbreak. Like the scientists from then were very excited to share any evidence they had of the origin of that outbreak. So yes, there was a cover up about how large the outbreak was to, to save face. They didn't want to show that, you know, they had thousands of cases or anything like that. They wanted to, to make it sound like everything was under control. But the scientists who were investigating the origin of that were actually very forthcoming with, with new data, like hot off their PCR machine, like hot off their, like, you know, culture. So by May 2003, so only two months since the virus was isolated from a patient, they had already shared data and news about an animal source with like, they, they had tested animals at the market and found signs of the vi a virus infecting those animals. So very excited to share all the data they had because they wanted to demonstrate mastery over like tracking an outbreak. And they did, like even to, to this day, the Chinese scientists who solved the origin of SARS-1, they're very well known, like they're, they're reputable for being the ones who tracked it independently without any external help. But today we're seeing the complete opposite is that they're saying we can't even find any cases before December. 
when the outbreak was detected, we didn't even test for uh, any of the antibodies uh, of, of banked blood samples. We didn't even bother to, to see how early this outbreak might have started in ground zero in, in Wuhan city. So not to say they needed to test like millions of samples across China, but to not even do it at Wuhan, <laughs> to not even bother to check. I mean, how could it be that they have the best experts for tracking SARS outbreaks in this city and they're telling us that they have zero ability to investigate? I mean, I, I think that, yes, there's a cover-up. They, they, they tried to cover up and they tried to show they did a really good job of containing the outbreak. They, they tried to tell people it's not spreading amongst humans yet. But there's also this part where they kind of look very incompetent at this rate that they can't even trace any early cases. They didn't even check the animals being supplied to Wuhan. They didn't even check for antibodies, it's, it's just a, uh, to me, it doesn't sound reasonable. And, and with the database, they easily could have sent a copy to multiple collaborators on day zero. And then they would have seen, yeah, that if there's a future insertion, they'll say, no, we got the original copy. And, and this is from someone else, like a bad actor. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, it, it, is, it is difficult to explain everything that was happening there. But, I mean, we might someday find that there is an explanation for all that. It might have been, yeah. this guy right here was scared to lose his job, so he made this happen and that happened. So it could have just been a series of people being scared of getting in trouble. I mean, for me, there was a huge change in approach. So we knew mm -hmm. that, you know, in the early week of, of this outbreak, it, it seemed like they truly were convinced that it came from the market. Not just the local CDC, even the Beijing CDC flew yeah. in to sample that market. They weren't just sterilizing the market. They took hundreds of environment samples and hundreds of animal samples. They went on to test hundreds and thousands of animals in the province, in the city. Like they were clearly looking for the animal source. They were really keen on this. And then suddenly in early 2020, like all of that stopped. Like they just like, I'm not testing any animal samples from the farms. I'm not even looking mm. for early cases anymore. Everybody destroy your patient samples, um, no more speaking to the press. Like there was a gag order on the national CDC, all of the networks, all the CDC offices were gagged in February. Uh, yeah. Scholars in China were gagged. They were told not to submit anything on the origin unless it had been through multiple levels, even government level approval. So somewhere there was a change in, in mindset and I find yeah. that very disturbing. I mean, that could be explained by they figured out what actually happened and they weren't happy with what happened and they don't weren't they didn't want the world to find out. It could also have been that like uh this is now a world problem now and people are gonna be trying to trying to blame us, so no more talking about this. Everything's very speculative. A huge chunk of the evidence that people are talking about online for evidence that this was a lab leak is evidence of look, they're acting guilty. Therefore, mm -hmm. They probably, it's probably a lab leak. I understand that that should be taken into consideration, but I also don't really know. I just don't understand how China would behave otherwise. I mean, I don't, I'm not smart enough to understand. I know that with SARS-1, even at the beginning, they were trying to cover it up and the World Health Organization is like, hey, we know that you guys have an outbreak. Mm -hmm. Will you just tell us now? <laughs> that was back when the World Health Organization had more teeth. They had back channels. They were actually investigating all the nations that were part of the, the WHO. They had little back channels to make sure that they weren't hiding stuff. We no longer have that. But I want to point out again that they were covering up the scale of the outbreak, but they weren't covering up the competence of their scientists. So their okay. scientific teams were very eager to show the world that we can track this. Yeah. So cases had first started appearing and being detected in clinics in the main cities in January 2003. Once they knew that, all the doctors were on alert and they even traced back cases as far back as November 2002. Uh, but by March, they knew it was a coronavirus and by May, all the scientists were sharing data about antibodies tested of animal traders, animals they found infected. So even though the, the scale of the outbreak was being hidden and the new patients were being hidden in elevators, being driven around the city in ambulances where the WHO was uh, visiting, but the scientists themselves were very interested to show the world we're, we're awesome at this. <laughs> we know how to track the virus. But here in this case, China is trying to show the world they did a really good job containing the outbreak. They even have a whole museum and exhibit set up in Wuhan precisely about this. But they are making their scientists look extremely incompetent. Like so incompetent that they don't test for antibodies. They don't test uh, they don't look for early cases. Uh, that they don't even test the animals being sent to the city. Like it's just it's just a picture of of very, well, I'd say it's a pattern of 
magnific- magnificent disinterest in this national security concern. So it's like this this yeah. killer virus has emerged. We're doing nothing, none of the basic things to, to track its origin. So you would be convinced if we had this three prong investigation. So track early mm-hmm. cases, get all that data public, uh, look for something in the wild. What if what if uh, the wild search research only found something? Like, w- would that convince you alone? Without investigating the early cases and without investigating the lab? Yeah. It would depend on the type of evidence. Like, what is it? Because it's been two years since this yeah. outbreak started. So if if in the first month or the first few months of the outbreak, they had found the animal host, then, then sure, everything's great. But two years later, how did they find an animal host? Because by now, like... All the evidence is gone. And that's why this this comes back to the first part of our discussion is that there's a time limit for investigating the origins. It's not mm-hmm. something where we can say, let's let's take the first five years of a pandemic to stop cases. And then after that, go back and look for clues about the origin. It's, it's too late. What you talked about last week, we actually do have data from emails and conversations. Yeah. Outside and of China. There are other ways to, to look into this as well. My bias is leaning towards, I really hope this is wild, that this doesn't start a big conflict between China and the United States, and it doesn't cause a big conflict between U.S. researchers and Chinese researchers. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, I, I have that bias, too. I know this sounds surprising, but I, I have that bias, too. I don't want scientists to get in trouble. But my way of thinking is that if scientists are not the ones taking the initiative to investigate a lab origin, then who will? Right. So it, I'd rather that scientists are part of the investigation than we just sit this one out. Because oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I care that we find the truth, but I, I think I think that will be easier to convince than you because... Uh, <laughs> because you pro- want it to be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, I mean, I, I, I I'll say this as I've been in science for many years, and, and that's one of the worst things that can happen to a scientist is that you yeah. want something to be true so much. And I've seen this happen to even top scientists that they are willing to overlook negative data. They're willing to cherry pick data. And that, that is very extremely dangerous. So yeah. not just for science, but all the people implicated, affected by this and in the same group, the people who try to reproduce that work and find that there's a whole bunch of negative data missing. So deep down in my core as a scientist, I absolutely reject that people <laughs> people cherry picking data or being lenient with themselves. I always find that we have, we have to be the most critical of our own favorite hypothesis. Because if you don't, you will you will roll. You will avalanche into into misconduct <laughs> or into scientific disinformation. Yeah, one of the, there was a there was a saying that I, I think I emailed this to you. Um, it was it's about confirmation bias. Yeah, and I don't remember who said this, but someone said uh, the best antidote to confirmation bias is to argue with people who have different confirmation bias. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Who have conflicting confirmation bias, and uh, I, I, I feel yeah, that's what we do in science. I mean, it's, it's how how this project works. I think that the public in general has a bias towards a lab leak. It's really hard for us not to want to blame someone for a catastrophe. I mean, this is, I think this is one of the reasons why people believe in in God and the devil is because when something good happens, they want to be grateful to someone. Mm -hmm. And when something bad happens, they want to blame someone. Well, I think one way to counter the sensationalism around this topic is to let scientists on this topic from each side talk to each other more often in public, directly, Mm -hmm. live events. So this way you remove any curtain of conspiracy any any sense of censorship or anything if you if you let them talk directly to each other and i'm not saying that uh this needs to happen for like scientific issues that are already set in stone but even even then it might help if you see people talk about vaccines in the in the context of autism and things like that if we can have more of these public events where people are talking directly to each other that removes this these silos on facebook or other social media where, where people are just listening to their own collective bunch of experts so i was really happy in september of this year when i was invited to be part of a four person panel by the triple as the science magazine yeah that was great yeah yeah i love that uh they put me and and jesse bloom on on the more agnostic slash lab, lab leak site uh, versus uh, Lin Fa Wang uh, from Singapore and Michael Warabi from Arizona who are, who are much more on the natural origin side. So we, we 
directly debated each other, directly discussed what is it that we know and don't know, what needs to be investigated. And I thought that meeting was extremely constructive and very civil. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Unfortunately, on Twitter, it's it's a complete like shit show. <laughs> but when you're directly speaking to someone, you're much more civil. You, you can be tough on them, but you, you're less likely to start uh, hurling insults at each other. Twitter does that. Twitter, early on in my Twitter adventures, I got into a Twitter fight with a uh, guy, Perry Marshall. <laughs> And then, and then I invited him to come on my show, and we had a, a just fine conversation. I feel like a lot of nuance and and important information and questions are lost when experts don't directly talk to each other. So actually, I'm very interested in being invited to to more interviews where, for example, I can talk to the authors of the Proximal Origin, uh, yeah, letter, the Nature Medicine, who set the tone for this discussion in early 2020, or to discussions uh, interviews where the World Health Organization new investigative team, the, the SAGO team, any of their members are brought in to, to just bounce ideas and see like what, what is it that makes them think a natural origin is more likely and how would they investigate it and, and, or how should they investigate lab origin. So I'm very interested in these more constructive uh, interviews. Yeah, You were on there with Michael Warabi. Am I mm-hmm. saying his name right? I, I think so. <laughs> and he wrote a letter with you in support mm-hmm. of... Well, this this was in the early days when the the lab leak hypothesis was demonized by pretty much everyone in the scientific community, and well, especially <laughs> I shouldn't say in the scientific community because I had I was talking to lots of people, and they're like, no, the lab lab leak is definitely possible, but not public since the start. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah, they weren't publicly saying that, and in the news, it was no, this is uh, this is definitely a conspiracy theory. But he wrote a letter with you. And mm-hmm. you also had a... Uh, Ralph Barrick, yes. Ralph Barrick was on there. And he's the one who runs the lab in North Carolina, right? Yes. And he collaborated with uh, Dr. Xu Zheng Li from the Wuhan Institute of Virology and Peter Dashang from the Eco Health Alliance. That was pretty nuts that he got on there. And he, he wrote this letter saying, no, we need to investigate a lab leak hypothesis. Yes. He had actually been saying that since even early 2020, but it was in an Italian documentary where he was quoted. And so not many people watched that documentary. He said whether or not this virus was genetically engineered, it's only in the records of this lab at Wuhan. Yeah. That letter, I'm going to be showing it on screen here for everyone to see. Mm-hmm. It's very important, I think, that people read that. There's some really good messaging in there. You guys worded that beautifully. Michael Michael Warabee now regrets. He doesn't. I don't know if he regrets having signed that, but he regrets the the backlash that it had. We went from the lab leak being demonized in the media mm-hmm. to right after that was published, the the lab leak was then considered the most likely probability. And actually, this happened again with your testimony last week i saw it was one of the british journals is saying lab leak is now the most likely hypothesis oh was it the daily mail <laughs> yeah yeah i think it's the daily mail yeah yeah i mean I, I i really wish that the news organizations would report the context of that quote yeah so i had been asked alongside uh my co-author, Matt Ridley, as well as the lancet's chief editor uh, richard Houghton, to each give a number a probability estimate of each origin hypothesis. And you refused. We all collectively refused, but but Richard Houghton said that he, he favored the World Health Organization stance, which was a lab origin was extremely unlikely. Mm-hmm. But I offered my judgment, which was that I actually leaned towards a lab origin. But there's no evidence right now, there's no specific evidence that can confirm or rule out any of these hypotheses. So throughout the meeting, I kept enforcing that we need an investigation. I even pressed the Lancet and other uh, journals to release all of the original manuscripts that had been sent to them uh, from China yeah. by scientists describing the early days. We need to take a look at what's in there. We know that manuscripts were withdrawn yeah. like after gag orders went down. So we, we need to know what journals had in their hands in the early days of the pandemic. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good strategy. I don't know if it would be wise to declassify all that right off the bat. Mm-hmm. But definitely people need to be looking at that. I mean, that's a huge source of... Fresh information. Especially for people who are like intelligence agencies and so on that that can look at stuff before they want to release it to the public. Because wh- I mean, one of the really nasty things about this whole situation is that anytime information gets out into the public, you get immediate explosion of in the media. Yeah. Them picking sides. You get these conspiracy theories that explode. I 
I just really struggle with the ethics of confidential information. I mean, if you keep things classified for a while, even just for temporarily, there's a bunch of eyes that don't get to see it that could help link something that's important. But if you do declassify stuff right away, then you have this other problem where everyone goes crazy. <laughs> so I, I don't know what to do with this. It's it's a it's pretty it's a complicated puzzle. Well, that's why I think it's so important to have these commissions and investigative te teams set up ASAP because yeah. they should be the ones previewing uh, these uh, new documents and things that may or may not deserve to be put out publicly just in case it cause harm to individuals. So once you have these commissions, then, then it's not a matter of am I exposing these individuals to attacks, but more of the information can actually be expertly reviewed and assessed yeah. first. Um, and that's why th these commissions should have people from both sides of the issue or people as centrist as possible, uh, as much balance as possible in this team so that uh, people who each side trust can be there to review this evidence. I think that that's key, like having people for, that represent many different views, many different mm -hmm. fields of research, intelligence agencies, scientists, Yeah, even get people like Tom Cotton in there, let everybody in on this, but maybe don't give it to the whole world all at once. Yeah. Declassify yeah. things slowly. But I don't but but it is a mess. It, it's very complicated. And do we want to treat everyone like babies? Uh, <laughs> I it's it's a hard question. I want to make sure that we get specifically to some questions that were well written by a YouTube user Ration Almind. That's that's his <laughs> that's his uh YouTube handle. He gave six questions. I there was three of them that I thought were most important, but I think you wanted to just address all six of them, right? Yeah, if we have time. So here is what Rational Mind wrote. His first comment, Alina talks about the Proximal Origins article in Nature Medicine saying, quote, the assumptions they make don't rule out a lab origin at all, so just because they wouldn't personally design a virus this way doesn't mean that this couldn't have leaked from a lab by accident. Couldn't have been the natural virus collected, brought to a lab, grown, and leaked, end quote. At no point does the Proximal Origin article discuss the scenario of a natural virus brought to a lab and leaked shortly thereafter, so that's true, but feels like a bit of a straw man of their article. They never argue along the lines of, quote, we wouldn't have designed a virus this way, so therefore it wasn't designed, end quote. They mostly argue that the properties of the virus appear more indicative of a natural process than a deliberate engineering. The closest they came to Alina's description was in the section about mutations in the RBD, that's the spike protein's binding region. There they basically argued that the RBD wasn't optimal for binding human ACE2 and conclude, this is strong evidence that SARS-CoV-2 is not the product of purposeful manipulation, end quote. It seems quite clear to me from context that when they say purposeful manipulation, they're referring to manipulation with the deliberate attempt at engineering a bioweapon targeting humans, but I agree the language is fairly vague in this regard. I wonder if the language made more sense at the time when the most prominent lab scenario being circulated was one of a bioweapon rather than an accidental release of a pathogen of unknown virulence. So that is the first of six comments by Rational Mind. And if I could summarize his concern here, he worries you've straw man their paper by summarizing their argument as, quote, scientists would not have designed a virus this way, therefore it wasn't designed. Proximal origins. Their letter was worded in such a way that a lot of readers, including experts, including journalists and science communicators, took away an overly simplified message. When people read this paper, the language was so vague that they left thinking that this virus must be natural in origin. The reason for that is because there's some quotes in this proximal origin letter that are very, I'd say, assertive. <laughs> so yeah. they say, since we observed all notable SARS-2 features, including the optimized RBD and polybasic cleavage sites in related coronaviruses in nature, we do not believe that any type of laboratory-based scenario is plausible. With the accompanying press from Scripps, where the lead author is from, the title was The COVID-19 Coronavirus Epidemic Has a Natural Origin, scientists say. And uh, the author was quoted as saying, we can firmly determine that SARS-CoV-2 originated through natural processes. And then later, the lead author was interviewed 
and and the news article was published in a very reputable site, uh, the CDRAP site, so it's a Center for Infectious Diseases, calling the lab release of a natural virus a conspiracy theory. Yeah. So this article said that even a natural virus leaking from a lab is a conspiracy theory. And the lead author of Proximal Origin told the, the reporter, the new coronavirus clearly originated in nature, no question about it now. So if you look at all of this, collectively what was happening in early 2020 with this letter is that they were telling people that they have no doubt that this virus was natural and interviews surrounding it all said that scientists say that this virus is natural so so imagine the message that was going out so I, i think that it's a problem that the language was so vague as russian almine also thinks that the wrong <laughs> and inaccurate message was taken away by the public and even by expert science communicators. He says that he thinks that maybe they were attacking the bioweapon hypothesis rather than an accidental, accidental release of a pathogen. I'm kind of bothered by that because from the very start, there were several very distinct hypotheses. There was a bioweapon hypothesis, mm-hmm. which most people thought was garbage from the start. We had the, the intelligence agencies actually came out really early on and said that no. We don't have any evidence that this is a bioweapon. And you would need a lot of evidence to prove it's a bioweapon because of the implications of that. Um, in, my, in my animation, I actually talked about the bioweapon and I said, extraordinary e- uh, claims require extraordinary evidence. Mm-hmm. And a bunch of people are mad at me for saying that. Like, it's not an extraordinary claim. <laughs> yes, it is. It would cause a war. <laughs> it's a very extraordinary claim. Plus, it's a claim that requires intent. So yes. you need to, to find the intent. You need to prove the intent. Whereas yeah. an accidental lab release or just, just ignoring the, the intent, just a lab origin has a much lower burden of proof because you don't have to say what was the scientist thinking at the time when the, when the virus escaped. We already had very, very distinct hypotheses. And actually, if you watch my animation, the lab leak hypothesis that I show in there, I show like this little vial and there's a, a post-it note that says, this it's a new virus that Larry found. And then one of the bottles breaks. So... The first thing that I was putting out there was that this was a natural captured virus that escaped from a lab accident as a possibility. The the conversations happening in the public were covering all of these different possibilities, even Tom Cotton. The bioweapon issue, I think it got blown up. I think it was a straw man. Yeah, I mean, and, and some very prominent news organizations were doing this too, which is very surprising because you expect them to be a bit more rigorous in their fact-checking, to actually watch Tom Cotton's interviews and hear what he's saying. But unfortunately, I think in America especially, but actually worldwide, like people tend to not even care what the person is saying anymore. They just take what they see someone else reporting and recycle it into the news, which is not great. And even as scientists, this is the one thing you should never do, which is just copy citations from other papers. Like you need to go back to the original source, read that paper first, and then cite it. The first time that I read it, the Proximal Origins paper, that actually calmed me down. When I reread it, I'm like, oh yeah, this is pretty (laughs) misleading. Next, Rationale Mind talks about the diffuse grant. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be showing his comments on screen right now, so we can just summarize them. Yeah, well, he's arguing that the proposal, the diffuse proposal, said this cleavage site insertion would be happening at UNC, where Ralph Barrick is based. Yeah. So the proposal said that this engineering of SARS-like viruses would happen in North Carolina, not in Wuhan City. But my response to that is that this grant involved an international team of scientists, but amongst all of these scientists, the only ones who had access to the raw sequencing data, the actual sequencing data where they could detect these novel cleavage sites, and also had the technology to insert these cleavage sites into SARS-like viruses, and had the idea to do this and the funding, this lab was very well funded, was the WIV. This this is the only partner out of this entire collaboration that had access to the sequencing data. So this is what sets them apart from Ralph Barrick, who did not have access to the sequencing data. And these labs were also extremely well funded, like just rolling in the millions every year. <laughs> That even if they didn't get this DAPA grant, like easily elsewhere, the Chinese government is showering them with, with money. So I also hesitate to speculate too much. I'd say that what is clear that we need to do now is to get the Health Alliance to release all emails, documents, data, and exchanges relating to this type of work. So 
who proposed the idea? That's the main thing, right? So if Wuhan scientists proposed the idea, then I think we, we're pretty good here. <laughs> so we, we know that they already had the idea of what preliminary work had been done and where. Uh, had any sequence or data even been shared? Had they seen these novel cleavage sites mm-hmm. that were proposed in the in the grant? Uh, what about after the grant was rejected? Was this idea recycled in another grant? Or were there more conversations about this type of work? So yeah. all of these are knowable. Like we can literally just go to Eco Health Alliance in New York right now and say, can you share your emails? So it's it's right. not something where we will never know. So a lot of people don't like your uh, unicorn analogy. <laughs> For various reasons, I think maybe because it sticks so well in everyone's head. <laughs> so and, and that, concept are pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I think people have been attacking it because it is an analogy. And mm. Of course, it's easy to attack an analogy, uh, an argument by analogy, and then also because it that it captivated the media so well. Mm-hmm. And so he's saying he's saying that your unicorn argument isn't quite the smoking gun that you think it is. I don't think you've ever called it a smoking gun. No. And you've been very clear saying that all we have is circumstantial evidence. So. Yeah. And it, it's a striking coincidence, but coincidences do happen. But yeah. in this case, what, what is clear is that we can investigate and we should investigate. That revelation that they had plans to add a furin cleavage site was pretty dang shocking. Yeah, for me too. I want to talk about the other side of this. So and this is actually sixth question. He he asked what you think about these other relatives of SARS-CoV-2 that have been found outside of China. Mm-hmm. And in Laos, I think it was, we found partial sequences that look like the furin cleavage site. No, so they, they didn't. Uh, I, I think that is a speculation. So uh, my my colleague and I, uh, Xin Hei-chan from, from Canada and I, we mm-hmm. recently published a peer review paper explaining what exactly is it about these... Uh, supposed intermediate furin cleavage sites that some scientists are reporting. So they are reporting a a, a very boutique alignment of of sequences that cannot be substantiated by by hard data, by structural data. So that when you align sequences, there are many, many ways to align them. It's like solving a puzzle. Uh, Until you get more evidence, until you get more and more robust data, you cannot say that this is the correct alignment. So you have to wait for more data to occur before you you yell like bingo. <laughs> so you can't yeah. you can't have one X and then you strike it and you say you got bingo. You need you need to fill out a lot before you have a confident uh, alignment. Your paper got published, right? This one. Yeah, uh, it's in Molecular Biology and Evolution. Yeah, it's a it's a very reputable journal in its field in evolutionary biology. Michael Warby showed a diagram with the alignments during his debate with you. This paper is a response to that. So it's not a response to Mike Warby himself, but that there are a lot of different scientists who are proposing different alignments. And what we are saying is that none of these alignments are well substantiated by data. So it, I think what we presented was actually the most moderate and scientific view possible. It's, it's saying we don't have enough data yet to call it. So I, I think that that's how scientists should operate. Like not every publication should be people confidently asserting that they know something. Some, some publications, some of the most important ones are those that say we don't know enough yet. But I also want to expand on this Laos thing, which is that okay. actually more emails were leaked, uh, were foia uh, from only in October this year, or even November, I think, uh, showing that the WIV, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, had started amassing thousands of samples from seven Southeast Asian countries, including Laos. They were letting uh, people from the Wuhan Institute of Virology come to collect samples or sending hundreds of these samples up into Wuhan City. So we know that they had access to these viruses that look very similar to SARS-CoV-2, not just in China, but from seven Southeast Asian countries. And this started in 2016. We have no insight to what they found. We have like zero insight into what they found between 2016 and 2019 when the pandemic started. So there is a lot of investigative work to be done. So we found all of these new viruses that are even closer to SARS-CoV-2, barely closer, but they are mm-hmm. a little bit closer than RATG13, which was the yeah, first there's virus. One virus. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's one virus that's slightly closer than RATG13. Yeah. But what what you're saying is that that's kind of a mute point because these are... These are viruses that the Wuhan Institute of Virology probably already knew about. 
Well, they had access to that population of viruses. Yeah. And, and none of these close relatives have even an intermediate viewing cleavage site. So they don't even have any insertions in this area. Instead, what mm. we're seeing is that amongst all the closest relatives to SARS-CoV-2, they're very conserved in this area. Yeah. There's no insertion in this area. So that means to us that this furing cleavage site appeared in SARS-CoV-2 very recently because all yeah. of its closest family members don't even have an intermediate, don't even have an insertion in that area. I do want to point out, though, because, you know, I've, I've got you on here saying something that, that, that a lot of people are in conflict with. So it's I think it's my job to push back a little bit on this. There has been... From the start, the the Fuhrer and Cleavage site argument has evolved a lot to mm-hmm. keep the conclusion. So I, I am seeing people that are that are trying to chase data to keep their conclusion that this was genetically engineered. I am seeing that that behavior. At first, everyone was saying beta coronaviruses never have Fuhrer and Cleavage sites, and then we're like, uh, yeah, we've been working with them. Like the mouse beta coronavirus has one, and we've known this since like early 2000s. For me, I even expressed that this, this furing cleavage site, it wasn't its rareness that stuck out to me, actually. It was the fact that it wasn't even mentioned in the Wuhan Institute of Virology's first paper. So that, for me, was the weird thing. And I also used a unicorn analogy. I said it was like them describing this newly found unicorn, describing everything but not the horn. Like describing the hair, describing your hooves, <laughs> describing the fur and the inner skin, everything. And they're like, oh, we're done here. <laughs> not, not mentioning the horn. So for me, that was the thing that was that set off a light bulb for me. But even so, I didn't, I didn't say that I think it's genetically engineered. I just said it could be on the table, but it's not that interesting to me right now. Then there was a bunch of noise about the, the codons being unusual. And it seems like that's been debunked now too. Like we have found those codons used in, in nature as well as in the laboratory. Yeah, I actually pushed back on that too. And I got a lot of trouble yeah. <laughs> from the lab yeah. crowd because they're like, why are you dismissing our evidence? I'm like, because it's not, it's not that strong of an argument. So now we're left with the, the main evidence is the circumstantial evidence saying that, look, we have the DARPA proposal. Mm-hmm. And we had the fact that when people reported on this, they ignored the Fuhrer and Cleavage site when that should have been like the highlight of, of their paper. And, and and we know that they were aware of these sites. They had a whole yeah. pipeline for detecting them. And they had in recent years been inserting these into other coronavirus parts. So yeah. it wasn't like they had never encountered a Fuhrer and Cleavage site before. Again, I there is good circumstantial evidence for this. But I am seeing this weird game where people say... Okay, okay, I guess you're right. That wasn't really that great of evidence. But what about this? And they keep trying to come up with new excuses. And for me, that's always that's always a sign of... Yeah, conspiracy thinking. You're in love with your <laughs> conclusion and you don't want to, to change. But I, I do admit that we do still need to consider this a possibility because of that DARPA uh, paper and because of, as, as what you mentioned, the, the ignoring of this when they first started talking about these viruses. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody who has argued yeah. about the fearing cleavage side. I can only speak for what I have personally said. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's this situation where people want me to answer for the crimes of others. <laughs> I would say like, I'm, I'm very empathetic to both sides, but I, I can't take responsibility for extreme things that other people said that I actually disagreed with strongly yeah. at the time. Yeah. 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 Let's see. Question number, I'm going to go back up to question number five. Mm -hmm. You say it yourself, every piece of evidence on this can be dismissed and it actually can be dismissed fairly easily. He's talking about something that I said last time. Mm -hmm. And then I followed that up with, but it's when you take it all in together that it likely looks like a sign here. And then he says, but I I prefer my houses to be made of bricks, not cards. (laughs) <laughs> I, I agree. Obviously, that's 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 why we're we're pushing for an investigation. Is because the the bricks the bricks are hiding somewhere in China, either in the wild, uh, most likely in China. I mean, maybe we'll find that this that this uh, evolved outside of China. That's fairly unlikely, but most of these bricks probably exist in China, and China's not letting us go find those bricks. And so that's the okay. Let me rephrase that: the Chinese government is not letting us <laughs> go find those bricks. People, if you just say China, I find people think that that's they interpret that as being racist. Yeah. But the we want it, we want solid answers to this. We don't want to have to be speculating. Like this is this is getting pretty absurd. 
I fully support having a real investigation. That is how you will find the bricks. And yeah. some of them are outside of China. Again, it's, it's pieces of information, emails, messages sent out. So uh, it's knowable. It's within reach. And I, I disagree with people who, who think that we will never know <laughs> without even making any efforts to try. Then he goes on to say that he thinks it's obvious that you think that this is a lab leak. Something that I've heard from other people is that you want this to be a lab leak. I don't have any wants <laughs> about this origin. What I want is an inv like investigation. So I want an investigation. Again, as I pointed out earlier, in, in my experience in science, the danger is when you find yourself wanting a certain outcome. And that's, that's when I'm the most critical of myself. So all the way through writing this book, I, I was beating myself up all the time, like thinking I fact-checked everything to an inch of its life, like to, to make sure that everything here was as unspeculative as possible, as unbiased as possible. Like I know it's difficult to catch your own bi biases, but I'm saying I made best efforts um, because ultimately I have very long-term thinking about this book is that I want it to stand the test of time. I'm not one of these people who just wants to let my reputation wash all the floor like <laughs> in the future when it's found to be you know, wrong or inaccurate or not fact-checked. Like As a scientist, my reputation is built on being extremely facts-focused, like very unbiased. So this book, I wrote it fully intending for it to stand any assault of, of time. Like no matter what you find in the future, like this book is like solid. It's, it's made of like rock. <laughs> so... Um, I'm not saying I don't have bias. I certainly have them. Everyone, everyone has biases, but I did my best to be aware of them. We've only got a few minutes left. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about your co-author because a lot of people have been very upset about his, his involvement in your book. He's had a long history of run-ins, like basically trying to say that scientists are wrong in their consensus about different things. He attacked the natural origin of HIV and then he has said things about climate change or where he's contradicting the scientific consensus. And so it's pretty clear, or it, or it seems clear to a lot of people that he has this kind of bone to pick with scientific consensus in general. And maybe when he saw this, it was, he pounced on it because he's like, aha, scientists screwed up here. Let me, let me rub it in their noses. So first I'll clarify that Originally, Matt thought that this was a natural origin. So the first time when we connected, he was writing an article about this coming from nature. So um, this was in early 2020. And it was only over time as more and more disturbing information was released, you know, about the miners, about all these closely related viruses under study in Wuhan, that we both started thinking we need to lay out all the evidence and wherever that points it is where it points. And we eventually leaned towards a lab origin because of the diffuse proposal. That, that was like a very large switch for us. Um, but by focusing on Matt, I I think that you have to look at him in totality, the same way you look at like Francis Collins or, or Anthony Fauci in totality. Yes, there are things that people will do wrong in their lives or, or you disagree with them strongly about, especially the older they are, the more things you will find that you disagree <laughs> yeah, with them yeah. doing like 20, 30 years ago. Like we will all eventually be canceled. So, so like, don't worry. <laughs> so, um, I, I will eventually be found guilty of something as I reach my 50s and 70s. So when when I when he reached out to me saying, do you want to write this book together? I, I did go and, and carefully review what else had, he had written but I didn't find a deal breaker. Yeah. And I need to explain my story before this makes sense, is that I was born in Canada, but I, I spent my childhood in Singapore. And then mm -hmm. I grew up, I did most of my young, young adulting in Canada. And these two countries are extremely multicultural in a yeah. way that's actually quite different from the US, even though there are many different races and, and cultures here, is that in, in Singapore and Canada, people's different cultures are celebrated. Like we don't try to hide these differences or, or cancel each other. <laughs> like we can still say Merry Christmas to each other. <laughs> like yeah. we, we celebrate every holiday as the intended holiday it was meant to be. Like we we have this culture of tolerance. I'm not saying that these two countries like perfect, nothing wrong ever happens. That there, there is. There's still disparities, there's still racism. But it's very different from the US, where if if you disagree with someone on one topic, suddenly they're they're the most evil and horrendously ignorant person you've ever met. Like that that couldn't fly in a country in Singapore. In defense of oh. my country, 
<laughs> it seems a lot more like that on TV than yeah. it is in real life. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We we all get along with each other for the most part, off camera. <laughs> off off camera. Yeah, yeah. Off yeah. off reality TV. I say I, I do live in Canada now though, so uh, <laughs> what am I fleeing from? Yeah. yeah so I, I grew up in the place where you you had no choice but to work well and live well and play well with people who have very extremely different values and upbringing from you. Is and if you look at Matt Ridley and I, like, it's we are such different people with such different experiences, values. Like, I'm very extremely liberal. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can tell. Um, yeah. And I, I, I didn't grow up in a rich family or anything. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I tried to. I had a very extremely normal childhood, like not thinking I would do anything great in my life. So, <laughs> so I think very different from Matt, who 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 was kind of like born into a great tradition of like, like Ridley's. So, like, I think the book is robust because two people with such different backgrounds and values and dispositions even can come together and agree on every single line that comes into this book. So yeah. this is how you check each other's biases as well. Um, I know it, it's not as robust if I wrote this book with the lead author of Proximal Origin. Maybe that would be more extremely robust, but I don't, I don't see how that collaboration can happen. I did, I did actually reach out at one point and say, do you want to co-write something? And I didn't get a response. So <laughs> you can see I didn't yeah. even try. But um, I, I think that people are attacking the book and they, they see that there's nothing to attack in terms of its content. So they're attacking my co-author. And like, I... You know, it, it, yes, he has a conservative network. There's nothing denying that. Like, he, he has a lot of friends who are conservatives. He gets invited onto conservative shows because they know him. Um, and I'd say maybe it's my fault as, as the liberal person in this equation that I have no networks to, like, liberal news media. And they've, some of them have, have expressed fear of covering this topic because of the, the prevailing perception of what the scientific consensus is. And, and the idea that if this comes from a lab, then the Democrats have lost. Like, that that's nuts. So th there's a lot of that at play. People don't see the interviews that I am declining. So I've already had many chances to go and make this book a bestseller on some of the most extremely watched cable news or, or shows in this country, in, in, the, in the US, and I've declined them all. Because the profits of the book don't mean anything to me if the book gets denigrated. By, by people being used for political reasons, being called like a, a right-wing book. Like, this is not what I want for the book. The book is meant to be a very objective description of the search for the origin of COVID-19. Um, and I also want to say one thing in, in Matt Ridley's defense, though. Even though he has had some points where he clearly clashed with the scientific establishment, he actually wrote some very prominent books in science, like his book Genome. Like, it's the reason why one of my friends is a scientist today. So a lot of people in my circle who are liberals know about these books. They read these books and they have an impact on their life, like change their lives, make them go into science. So I think we have to look at things objectively, not just going for the parts we hate most about people. Because how, how can you have a functioning society? Or how can you be a world leader if, if yeah. people inside are tearing each other apart for the smallest things? Like the, just they're always going for the, the one thing that they hate about the other person instead of all these other ways they could be working together constructively. One of the things that I heard him say, it's actually in the, in the, the, the testimony that you guys gave to, par it was the parliament, right? Yeah, the science and tech committee. He mentioned that there was a bunch of stuff he kept wanting to put in the book. And you're like, no, you can't put that in there. That's not, you can't back that up scientifically. And so he was. Yeah, I, I, I run a really tight ship. And, and you'll, you'll hear that from other people I work with too, is that when I send my comments or edits back to them, they're like, the whole thing has been rewritten. <laughs> is that like, I don't, I don't let a lot slide. So you're the reviewer that no one wants in their paper, huh? No, no, no. Actually, in, in peer reviews, I'm extremely, like, not extremely nice and constructive and detailed. Like, I'm not mean. I'm not mean in my edits. I'm just extremely thorough. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a lot of training in editing. Okay, we only have a couple minutes left before you got to go to another meeting. And I want to spend that time, if you're cool with this, talking about racism. There has been an increase in racism against Asian Americans. There are a lot of people who are very concerned about even talking about the lab leak hypothesis. They think it's going to cause racism. And I am not upset with people being concerned about that. And I don't think it's... I almost don't think you can be overly concerned about that because actually racism if it gets out of hand, xenophobia, once it gets out of hand, can be as catastrophic as a pandemic. And we, we saw this 
with the Holocaust, that the Holocaust deaths are still higher than COVID's deaths. Obviously, the racism that we're seeing right now is not nearly close to being on par with the Holocaust. <laughs> but you don't know where things could go. If So I, I am very in favor of us being cautious with not accidentally provoking racism. I, I, I take seriously the allegations that we could be doing what, what people call dog whistling. You know, like we're... We're giving things to racist groups and to hate groups that they might be able to use. However, the, the lab leak hypothesis, I don't even see how this could be a racist hypothesis. This is a failure of Western science if this was a lab leak. This isn't a, this isn't a failure of Chinese culture. It's a failure of Western science. And actually, the, the meat market hypothesis... There's a lot more, that if, if you're racist, that you could blame China for. yeah. The bat eating, which actually didn't happen. Like, actually didn't happen. Like, there were no bats sold in these Wuhan markets. The lab leak hypothesis is not, I don't see it as being a racist hypothesis. I do understand, though, that just bringing up these issues again could cause conversations to happen again. I was talking to one of my old Chinese roommates, and he told me that he felt nervous early on, and there was obviously some racial tension early on, but that's calmed down. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the more as we start talking about this stuff again, that there's a chance that that will flare up again. I think it's flaring up more on the U.S. side in terms of holding U.S. scientists accountable because we've seen that a lot of these research collaborations were led by U.S. scientists. It was led by the Equal Health Alliance, which is based here in New York and heavily funded by U.S. sources. But yeah. I think it's... It's, it's not right to think of this in a country-specific manner because, frankly, this type of research is happening in so many countries. Yeah. <laughs> that, that it's, yeah. it's not like it's a China thing or US thing, but now it's like everybody is doing this type of research thing. So it's a criticism of the safeguards that have been placed around this type of research. It's not yes. a criticism of a culture. Um, and I think that the media could help a lot by spreading that message by yes. also highlighting the brave work of whistleblowers in China, like citizen journalists, journalists, scientists, doctors in China who gave up a lot. Some even gave their lives to report about this pandemic in the early days. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you report those stories more, then you will be countering that racism because you will give people a much deeper understanding of it wasn't the culture that was at fault. And actually, people in that culture were so brave that despite being in a place where they could be tortured, imprisoned, disappeared for, for sharing data with the world, they went ahead and did it anyway. So those stories need to be amped up. And it's something that we've done in our book and was also in that science letter that I co-signed in May. Just, just reminding people that the first people who responded were Chinese like whistleblowers and doctors. Like We, we owe so much to them and we shouldn't forget their stories. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on. This was great. I, I hope that people feel like we responded to their questions adequately. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Come along, material. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We went, up, we went all over the place. This was fun. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to take a break on this subject for a while, at least, yeah. at least I think until this, this next wave, the Omicron wave is done, because I actually do agree with Francis Collins that probably right now uh, we should be focused on yeah uh, tamping down this uh this outbreak i actually want to recommend two people that i think would be great for your interview for omicron which is probably a uh, u.s based uh trevor bedford he's very solid on this trevor um, bedford yeah. yeah and also uh, he, he's based in seattle uh and and in in europe uh emma hotcroft cool yeah. great well thank you i really appreciate your time and yeah. uh merry christmas Oh, yeah. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I hope you get more sleep. Sorry for taking yeah. up your sleep cycle. <laughs> Thank you.